you could have everything in place you all you want and you're ready to go but you still just won't go right time to start Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 410. Today, my guest is Sensei Lee Taylor. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show, the founder of Whistlekick, and I love the martial arts. It's my job. And part of that job is bringing you this show twice a week. On Mondays, we have guest interviews. On Thursdays, we release a topic show, something that's maybe a bit of a deeper dive into a style or a person. Or maybe just a subject I want to rant about. You can find all the episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And you can find everything we do, from this show to all the other projects and the products that we offer at whistlekick.com. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you'll save 15% off everything we have available for sale. As you might imagine, I love martial arts podcasts. And so when we have the opportunity to speak to someone else who also has a martial arts podcast. I love the conversations we get into. The people that I get to talk to have different but similar stories. They have different but still a martial arts take on the show that they offer. And I just find that we get into some great stuff because they know how to have these kind of conversations. And that's what we have today. My guest, Sensei Taylor, offers his own show, which you can check out. We've got links in the show notes. And we had Every bit as good of a conversation as I had hoped for and expected. So, here we go. Sensei Taylor, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, It is an honor to have you here. You know, a a fellow podcaster. I love having other (laughs) podcasters on the show because they know how to use microphones and things. And (laughs) things like, like talking here and then they turn away and then nobody can hear them. And then they turn back and then they turn the other way. (laughs) <laughs> and then they turn back i'm and a it, newbie yeah. <laughs> i could just about use a microphone i'm a newbie i'm a white belt at podcasting oh, white belt at pod- oh. oh what a fun <laughs> analogy oh. well there i i'm gonna have to noodle with that on my own because we <laughs> where would i put myself i mean we're four years in and, wow so am i am i like a like a green belt or brown belt or oh no maybe more a, than that a, a a, a sort of rushed showdown. Considering the esteemed guests you have and how many podcasts you put out, I think you're pushing showdown easily. <laughs> well, thank you. But I mean, if we continue that analogy, you could be a terrible martial artist and still train with some great people. True. That's and, right. And and I've known some of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> how, how, how have you learned from these wonderful martial artists who are also great teachers in their own right? Because, of course, you can be good at something and not be able to teach it. And then you're just so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think they just, they just don't take it in or, or act on the information they're given. They're, you know, they, they, don't, they don't apply whatever they've seen or heard or, or been told. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of that. I think there are people out there who simply want to check a box. They want to say, I trained with so-and-so or I trained it's, under so-and-so. Oh, oh, yes. They don't really care about their skill. No, I've come across a lot of that. Even attending seminars, you see quite high-ranking uh, attendees and they're not really in the room, as it were. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually obvious. thinking the same. And I've been there and, and you know, listeners know that, that I get the opportunity to travel around a little bit with, with Bill Wallace. And people will come to the seminar, they pay the fee, they suit up, they warm up, and then they sit down. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a pet peeve of mine. I see it all the time, and they're not even taking any notice of the guy they spent money to be in the room with. No. No, and, then, <laughs> and then at the end, they take a picture, and they post it on Facebook <laughs> and say, you know, I just got done with a great seminar yeah. with so-and-so, and I'm thinking, no, you didn't. You showed up. <laughs> yeah, you entered the room. That was about it. It, it, it sounds like we have, have the back of a t-shirt there. Martial arts. You have to do more than just show up. That's good. I like that. Feel free to steal that. <laughs> I might well do. All right, cool. Well, I'm glad to have you here. And I'm glad that, you know, I, I can already here. see we're, we've, we've got some good banter going. I think this is going to go well. I'm looking forward yeah. to, to all the places that we're going to go. But I like to start in a pretty fundamental way, just as we do in martial arts. We start with the fundamentals. 
So how did you first find martial arts? Well, my earliest memory, I think I was about five, and we lived opposite a church hall. And from my bedroom window, I could see down into the, the church hall. And every now and again, there would be people in there with uh, white suits punching and kicking each other. So uh, as, as we all know, karate starts in church halls and village halls <laughs> all across the world. Uh, so that was my earliest memory. I didn't understand what it was about. And then a few years later, um, it, at my uncle's house, I saw two huge trophies with some sort of strange man on the top of them in a pose and a piece of paper on the wall with some strange writing on it and that was i was told that was karate so i thought oh what is this karate thing that you get strange certificates and big trophies and it intrigued me even more because my uncle said you well you can't try karate until you're in secondary school which i presume is high school for you guys yes about 11 11 years of age uh we, we'd call that junior high often oh, okay junior high or middle school so it's even intrigued then it was like whoa what, why is it so special that i can't try until i'm in big school so um it was via my uncle so my dad took me along to my first session with him and that's how i got into karate now did you have did, did you in fact have to wait uh, yes okay so, so so here we have kind of a, a tried and true marketing tactic to say you can't do this, you can't have this, and I suspect that made you more interested. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, it's like, oh, what are those massive trophies? <laughs> so I get that for taking part in karate, mm. and didn't realize it uh, later. Obviously, when I was uh, training, I understood that the certificate was his uh, Dan grades, and the trophies were for taking part in kumite and things like that. So. Now, is this something that you started, you know, the day you turned 11? I mean, was this something um, that you Pretty much. Up? Yeah, pretty much so. When I started secondary school, that was it. I was like, right, I can start now then. <laughs> so we start school in uh, September. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty much pretty sure I was not far off from that. Wow. Straight, straight to the first class. And what hooked you in? You know, you, you'd been building up this anticipation and you start, and quite often, as, as we all know, Things that you anticipate that you look forward to for a very long time can be disheartening. They can let you down. Yes, definitely. Um, I think during that waiting period, as it were, there was obviously um, got involved with seeing some movies. Um, Bruce Lee is the classic. So I think my father introduced me to a couple of those movies. So that was sort of whetting my appetite for punching and kicking and not understanding what they were doing. But the look of it, I think, really being able to do that type of thing so uh yeah and once we started it was i didn't matter what it was or how it was delivered i was going to learn some martial arts so that was great and i was in and we're in hooked <laughs> for life now let's fast forward a, a few years because i think we all know that well I, I, i'm making an assumption that culturally it's similar over there that here in the united states we have a struggle with retaining children as they age into their teenage years because of just the distractions of, of social life and, and team sports. Yes. yes. That's the you same. Didn't, over here. You didn't step away during that time. sounds like. Um, no, right to the end of secondary school, which is about 14 or 15. Unfortunately, the club had to close. So when I went to college uh, for two years, so 16 to 18, and I didn't really get involved then. I sort of dibbled and dabbled with the odd club that was close, but not as intent as I was beforehand. And then from 18 to 21, I went to university. Um, same thing, that I wasn't really that interested in being full on in karate as I was through my, through my formative years. So I had a, probably about a four, five year break from it so mainly due to not having a club i suppose rather than not wanting to but yeah i see the problem we get we i have the same issue with my with my clubs the, the teenagers are becoming the adults but it's just life we're quite rural so a lot of them move away for college or university and like you say there are other 
sports on their list of activities for the week. It's a bit different to when I did it. It's probably we I'd be taking part in one or two sports, and that'd be about it. One of those was karate. Um, but children nowadays have got a lot in their diary. They sure do. And sure, probably four or five, or maybe five or six sports, and you happen to be one of them. <laughs> mm. All right. So, you know, during during this hiatus, do you remember what your thoughts were? Was it something you were missing? Something oh, it was always of... there. Okay. Yeah, it was always in the back of my mind. I still thoroughly enjoyed anything regarding martial arts, film wise, or reading, or magazines, books. So it was still there. Um, I test myself now and again to see if I can remember some of the katas and things like that. But um, it just wasn't at the forefront. It wasn't at my focus. I was studying and university then chasing the career so it just didn't reappear until later but it was always in the background it never left me and when you decided to go back when you decided to i'm going to guess jump back in with two feet yeah what was it you were looking for were you looking for a particular style a particular type of instructor or maybe certain days and times of the week that would fit in with well i was yeah, I studied leisure management at college and university, and I was chasing a career in leisure. So I was working for like a big sports center. So that, that includes shifts. So um, I couldn't really fit anything in while I was chasing that. But my circumstances changed when my second son was born, um, George. I managed to secure a training and development manager position. So I could go around uh, training people in the leisure centers on a day shift, as it were, so a nine to five. So I thought, oh, that's a possibility of doing something in the evenings again. And I think my wife just wanted me out of the house, to be fair. <laughs> so she suggested. And so I just thought, any karate in the area, that was my first thought. What's the, what's the nearest karate club? Uh, um, that was it. So I found it and got back in, which was about 1999. Now, one so, of the things that, that seems to happen with people when they take a break, they come back in, they can often get really frustrated with maybe failings of the memory or, you know, just muscle memory that, you mm. know, you, I remember I used to be able to do this kick this well, you know, with this <laughs> fight and, and that's not what's happening here. Yeah. And then what's further, happened to my body? <laughs> if it's not the same school, if it's not the same style. Yes. It was a different style. Add some complication too. So how did you navigate that? Well, my first, uh, the first style with my uncles was um, Wadaru. And then when I came back, um, it was Shukukai. So under the Shitoryu banner. Um, so not a major leap, because obviously some of the basics, some of the kata were the same. Um, but a little bit different in terms of the class structure from when I was first in the hall. So a lot more... Um, combinations a, a lot more involved in the kumite side and with the shukakai style you, you um which is renowned for its power and impact we we would do a lot of that on pads as well so that was um new to me as it were which really just um enhanced my love for just training really right and i'm going to guess because we we've already established that you're a, a podcaster and we didn't say specifically that your podcast is around martial arts, but it is. And when I think of the other folks who have been on the show who are martial arts podcasters, who, people who have dedicated things outside of their training to martial arts, they tend to be, well, I, I'd say across the board, they are incredibly passionate about their training. So how did you go from, I'm, I'm looking at getting back into this, to being that type of passionate? Um, yeah, well, it just organically grew really once you start or no one's really thinking about oh, i want to start to become an instructor you want to train and the thing sort of snowball from there i got involved in helping the association with the squads training and things like that i was a competitor as well with them and it started helping out in class and it grew from there it wasn't my intention and then a few years down the road as it were um I knew a few of my contemporaries had opened their own club. So I thought, well, that's not a bad idea, really. I can fit that in with my 
work life. Um, so that, like, again, it was like a natural progression. So I opened up a club in my hometown, which is quite ironic because that's where I started with my uncles many years mm. previously. So it sort of came full circle. And from then on, it got to a point where I thought, actually, this is what I want to do as a full-time profession. So about 2007, I think it was, I quit my job and became a full-time instructor. We have quite a few people on the show who have started their own school, but then the, I'd say the majority of our listeners are not school owners. Yeah. But a good chunk of them are considering it or, you know, would, would consider the idea, you know, maybe sometime in the future. Can you talk about how you went from the idea of starting a club to building it, quitting your job and it becoming your full-time employment? Um, like I said, so I was helping um, my instructor and the association. I was involved in training and competing. And um, like I said, my couple of my contemporaries uh, opened their own clubs. So I thought, I think it's about time my hometown had a club again. It's going to have been many years. A couple have drifted in and out, I think, over the years of different styles. So opened it with the association I was with. And um, a couple of years later, it, it just grew from that, really. I was getting not disheartened with my job, but it seemed to be getting in the way, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really notice it until you look back and think, yeah, because I, I moved, I moved my job around, trying to accommodate my club, and that was life saying, you know, take the plunge and do it now. But I ignored it and went, let me find another job to fit my club. So I did, and I was just like jumping out of the frying pan into the fire, same job, <laughs> different, um, different company, really, same problems, different company. And that only lasted two months because it was at that point, it was like I was away actually on an association trip um, with my oldest son and we were competing. Well, he was competing. I was part of the squad team. We had such a great trip and it was on that trip that it was, I don't want to go back to my job. Mm. And um, I rang my wife and said, I don't want to go back to my job. She so said, fine. <laughs> so she's pretty supportive and um, that was it so I got back from the trip and said handed my notice in and I was it's not for everybody the way I did it because I literally handed my notice in and I had one month to replace my wage I've got every every possible outgoing that everyone has you know mortgage cars bills but I had to do it and my wife said well do it then it was a big Big commitment, but it forced me to um, look at it seriously. And I opened a couple of other clubs in the area um, within that month of using up my last mm. wage, <laughs> and uh, it, it just it just grew from there. So that was back in two thousand and seven when I when I made the leap. Basically, and like I say, it's not an ideal format i wouldn't say this is how you start teaching full time because i literally jumped um but sometimes you do have to there are points where your life says you try it but you ignore it and like i say you can't really notice those points until you look back and when i look back there were two or three major points where i ignored it and just found another job to fit the karate club and it should have been the other way around but hey ho it just that was the way it was for me um, you can plan it as much as you want. And you can say, I'm going to do it when this is ready or I'll do it when I am financially secure or when this happens and that never happens. It never, never fits that scale. So at some point you just have to go, right, I'm going to do it now. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised how successful you'll be. It's not easy in a way in the world, is it easy? It's the hardest thing I've ever, ever done, but I've not worked a day in 12 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a great it's a great feeling isn't it the idea that oh, you yeah. get up do something you love and people will pay you for it and it's pretty yeah. phenomenal mm. if you had it to do over again what would you do differently nothing because it's where i am right now talking to you on a podcast which is amazing so i wouldn't change it for the world okay it just you can't have regrets it just doesn't 
work that way because you wouldn't be where you are at that point if you sure. hadn't made those choices. Sure. Were there any, and, and I fully understand what you're saying there. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask the question in a slightly different way. As you were going through this process, as you're leaving your job, starting these clubs up, is there anything that you could have done better from a professional sense? Um, possibly the folks listening who are, 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 you know, they're, they're nodding along saying, yeah, I want to do this, but I'm scared. So I was scared. Advice, right. I was scared. Um, I, like I said, I had every financial commitment going like every family man married with kids and houses does. So you could, you know, go down that road and say, well, I want to make sure that I financially secure, but you'll always keep pushing that limit, that, that time frame. You could say, right, I will want X amount in my account before I can then make this step. So if anything goes wrong, I'm okay to pay bills and things like that. But you'll always just keep pushing it because you really won't make that jump because it's still too comfortable, if that makes sense. It sure does. Yeah. So maybe that, but um, I think for me, that was just the best way for me to just to do it. It made me go out and make a success of it. You could have everything in place you all you want and you're ready to go, but you still just won't go right time to start. It's, too, it's still too comfortable. You need that <gasps> oh, feeling to go, right, it's, it's, it's on. And when it's we think like about some... that feeling, you know, not everyone may have experienced that in a professional, in an entrepreneurial sense, as you have, as, as I certainly have. But I think a lot of us have experienced that in our training. Yeah, I was just about to say that. It's just yeah. like stepping on the map. <laughs> yeah. How, for people who haven't done both, for people who haven't had that stressful experience of, of starting a business, how would you relate that to their experiences in their training? It, it is literally, it's like walking into um, the dojo for the first time or trying something new, anything for the first time you get, we get that feeling or that feeling of trying something that's um, you don't really know what the answer is going to be. Um, it's a bit like, I suppose, taking your driving test, that mm. injection of adrenaline into you going, I don't know what the outcome is. I've done everything I can, but I still don't know whether I'm going to pass. And it's the same uh, with your martial art training. It's like putting the gloves on and having your first spa and then taking it to the next level of, and competing and stepping on the mat uh, or, you know, Cata performance is the, you know, it's the same feeling. I've done everything I can, but I don't know how this is going to go. There's that bit where you just have to let it out, as it were. And you should be, you know, you should be fine. But you, this life is never like that because a couple of years into teaching, when I was just finding finding my feet, um, there was a big recession in the UK, and my uh, wife lost her job then. So it came to a crossroads again, the more pressure on me. And does she find another job that she's been doing for 20 odd years or does she retrain? And because she supported my decision, I said, well, it's up to you. And I suggest you try something different. So she actually went back to college full time for two years. So inadvertently, the same thing happened to her with that feeling of the unknown and a bit more pressure on me then to make the success I've only been teaching full-time for two years but that's life it just throws stuff at you but you you just you just find a way you just find a way so we had no income for my wife's side for two years because she was retraining um and there you go it's just another thing that life throws at you to make it interesting <laughs> or stressful <laughs> or stressful whichever way you want to look at it but there's always ways around and there's always ways through and you come out the other end and she came out flying colors from going to college because she, you know, had missed that in her youth going to college. So it was a big step for her and into the unknown and not having any income and training for two years, studying. And that, but it all, all turned out fine in the end. But you don't know it at the time. Right. <laughs> right. Hindsight's easy. Yeah, of course it is. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. Does your wife train? She used to, 
but she couldn't take instruction from me or my sons. <laughs> <laughs> your sons train. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so this, you know, your martial arts career started as a family endeavor and it's continued as such. Yeah, I, I got back into it and then um, I started getting my sons into it, involved, involved in it then, yeah. Um, but actually, my oldest son has did the same as me, really. He was, he's was he been chasing a career and he's really successful. Um, and he's literally, uh, where he lives, the other side of the UK, he's got back into a gi. So I'm well impressed that he's actually managed to, uh, I think he's at least, must be pushing eight, eight years away from it. Wow. maybe more and yeah he's had the guts to put the gi back on and step into a completely different dojo again and a different style and all credit to him and my youngest son who's 19 20 this year is in it as well mm. one of the things i've i've told people because you, you probably experienced this too people come up to you and, and they want to talk about martial arts because they used to train and there's some just yes. seeing you they seem to feel guilty and i've always told them hey when you're ready martial arts is there for you it's not going so, that's exactly right because it didn't leave me even though i wasn't training it didn't leave me so yeah you, you, people do come so i used to do it or this and that i say well you know when the student is ready the teacher appears as they say mm -hmm. now through this time through your training i'm sure you've experienced some some dramatic events, yes. some ups, some downs. You've probably trained with some colorful characters. And that yes. leads to stories. And of course, I love stories. That's the foundation <laughs> of the We tell stories. I provide space for people to tell stories. So if I was to put you on the spot, maybe at a podium in front of a group of people and say, Sensei's going to tell you his favorite martial arts story now. <laughs> story <day. laughs> um, well, Three years ago, I broke my neck. So probably that might be it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that falls under the heading of dramatic event. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> yes, I was um, finished teaching at a club, and at my club, and my son is learning to drive. So I said, you know, we can, you can drive me to the club and we'll do some training with the, with the guys there and drive back. And we said, he said, yeah, cool. So it was a good training session. Um, it's about half an hour away from where I live. February 2006, the weather weather wasn't great, but uh, we made our way home. Stopped at a garage to get some fuel and some snacks. So you can always go by the what if we hadn't stopped type thing. Uh, continued on, and I don't really recall much of it, but... My son just said, uh, what's he doing? So I looked up and this car just came straight at us. Um, like I said, I don't recall too much, but instinctively just pulled pulled the handbrake. And because the weather wasn't great, it span round and took the impact in the back end of the car. And as we say, not much memory of that event, um, but we were extremely lucky. Um, he overtook a couple of vehicles plus a big tractor and came straight straight for us. Apparently, I said to my, <laughs> to my son, George, uh, what are you doing driving the car? Because <laughs> that was my first first thing to say. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's a strange thing that you lose, you lose a timeline because we're quite rural out here. And I know the fire brigade who would, be attending our crash would take about 15 20 minutes to get to us along with ambulances and things and all of that timeline is just missing um but luckily my son got away with a few cuts and bruises and a broken finger uh, i got out of the car um i just about remember that i think and but in searing pain and i don't really remember much after that but apart from breaking my neck apparently well not apparently it happened <laughs> got stretched up got flown to hospital and there you go your your life literally changes in an instant it doesn't flash before you but it does change on a dime as it were and what was the recovery like um you your world shrinks instantly 
when you are then confined to your back, not knowing what's happening. So, you know, it, it just literally shrinks to the room you're in, looking at the ceiling, waiting to see or hear what's wrong with you. Um, I felt all right. I, I had nothing else wrong with me, but apart from the searing pain in my neck and scans and MRIs and things like that, it said, yeah, you've broken your C2 vertebrae. They were a little bit concerned because it was um, pressing on the artery as well at the time. And so you just, you get told that and you just hope and pray that the fracture isn't, as bad as it's uh, it could have been, uh, life changing and life threatening. So yeah, your world shrinks instantly. How did your martial arts experience um, impact that well, it's, recovery, it's, that outlook, etc.? Yeah, it's strange because it doesn't. At that moment in time, nothing mattered. It doesn't matter who I was or what I was or what I've achieved. At that moment in time, it could have been, you know, lights out, over. Um, I didn't know anything about it either. So I didn't feel anything or didn't re don't remember the impact or what happened after. So, you know, on the morbid side of it, if other people have been involved in such things or have family members involved in such, in such things, the little bit of um, comfort is, in my experience, I wouldn't have known anything about it if it was any worse. Um, so I'm, I'm like, my training or my health, what, what does that mean at that moment in time when a car is coming in the back of your car? But my um, osteopath said, well, you could look at it that your training and your health helped you absorb the impact more efficiently. So I said, um, okay, I, I could, I could take that probably. That sounds a little bit more, a little more correct because it was literally the fracture was. <laughs> it's hard to quantify, but it was that that close. From it's the hangman's noose one, as they say, the C two. And but then the recovery, yeah, in that terms of it, definitely the mental side, um, the aspect, and then the physical recovery. Then obviously, it's it's um, the training's helped no end, really. Probably more the, of the the mental side, and the physical side sort of just took care of itself. But I was in a I was in a neck brace from February to June, I think, and I managed to back to the dojos i think it was about um april time so i put me I'm still in the neck brace put my gi on and managed to get back to uh, back into the dojo i wasn't obviously doing anything i was sort of like a a figure standing there while my son and my other helper kept the clubs running while i was recuperating i managed to get and see them that was the biggest lift really is being back in a gi and back on the floor which helped no end. So I think it's more like a goal, really, that helped. How hard was it to be away from active training? Um, it's too, well, it's, it's weird because you think, I've got to get this right. I've got to heal correctly. I've got to take my time and get it right because it was the neck. And so you, on one hand, not really thinking about that, even though it is a big part of your life, because like I said, your world shrinks and you think, oh, I won't be back on that floor if I don't, you know, heal properly and get this right. So it was focused on that until a few months in, and then I was starting to feel better and move better, even though you're still in a brace. So you sort of come back to that part of your life then and think, well, I'm now, I need to start setting a goal to, possibly you know get back in the dojo and get back on the floor with the students and and that was a uh, motivation to go see them really most of us fortunately aren't going to experience that you know that kind of physical traumatic event i mean we, we all have events in martial arts i mean i i, I took a yeah. good shot on sunday 
you know, I think <laughs> most of us are used to something like that. Oh, you know, this, this lays yeah. up for a couple of days or, or maybe you're out for, you know, a couple of weeks or even a month, but very, very few of us are going to break their neck. Yeah. So maybe yeah. we can learn a little bit from your experience. What, what lessons came out of that for you that you might share with us? Um, you hear the um, life is short analogy a lot um, because of events that you experience or, um, you know, catastrophes and things like that. But it's, it's not that life is short. It's just life is very fragile and things can change in an instant that makes it appear short. Hindsight makes um, you think that life is short, um, but it's not. It's just fragile. And so, you know, an injury can put you out or like you say, you took a shot, but that could have led into something else. Um, so it's being more appreciative, really, rather than pessimistic about how long your life will be. Um, I'm very much more appreciative. It didn't change me as in terms of, you know, um, born again or spiritual, but it just makes you very appreciative of the time that you have or, and, and the people you spend it with. But uh, not, no, life is life. Uh, we can't guess at our time here, but it's, it doesn't take much for it to flip on its head, as it were. So be appreciative. When you think back over your time as a martial artist and all the people that you've talked to and trained with, if we had to make a, a list of who's been the most impactful on who you see yourself as now, today, as a martial artist, who would be at the top of that list? Well, people, people come and go in your life. Um, some people stay for longer reasons and some people just drift in and drift out. But every single one of them has a pivotal role as you go along your life. So obviously from my first instructor and my uncles, if they hadn't instilled um, for the love of the art into me, then I may have just quit and moved on. But obviously they have planted something in me. And then again, coming back into it with the support of my wife on many occasions, like when my son was born to get me out from under her feet <laughs> and start karate again and to go in full time. She's obviously a massive pivotal role to keep me on this path I've chosen. And then back into a different styles, a different instructors, they all impart a certain part of them onto you. So I wouldn't say there was a top of the list. The top of the list would be the current people that I'm training with, I suppose. And I'm sure it'll change again in the future. So I'm um, more of the fact that everyone that you come across or cross paths with or spend time with affect you on your own path. So more than a list of the person yeah. at the top, they all contribute. I can see that. So let's kind of flip that question. Who would you want to add to the list? From the um, karate point of view, from the Shitoryu Shukukai background, then the founder of Shitoryu was Kenwa Mabuni. Um, and from he had a huge knowledge base on kata. That's why Shitoryu have a huge list of kata in their syllabus. But <laughs> And even from his contemporaries, they all... Um, suggested that if you needed to know kata then he was the man to go to so even the founders of the other styles put ken mabuni up there as the man the, the go-to man for kata so yeah i think he'd be pretty interesting to train with i would agree absolutely now you mentioned earlier about competition and how competition is something that you had engaged in a little bit but it was kind of a, a passing comment Tell us about your experience with competing. So when I first um, started as a child in Wadaroo, um, there wasn't any um, competitive side of it. I think I briefly touched on a bit of kumite sparring with them. So when he came into it, when I came back, 
in 99 with the Shikukai group when um, sparring was more prominent. So I got a taste for it then. And then it, there was like, oh, yeah, we also do competitions. So I was like, okay, what's that all about? So, so it just built from there. So I went, um, took part in the association competitions and it, it um, enjoyed both Kata and Kumite. Quite successful within the association and competed for them locally, nationally. Uh, internationally within the Samurai Shukukai Association and and after that so you know had my fair share of uh, success and failure in both in both disciplines but enjoyed it thoroughly mm-hmm. let's let's talk about martial arts culture because something something in my gut tells me that this is this is a piece that deserves a little more attention for you than maybe some others. You know, you, you talked a little bit about Bruce Lee movies. You talked a little bit. No, no, I, I think that's all, that's all we've said. That's all we've said today. How important are, are martial arts movies and TV and, and maybe even books for you? Uh, books was a huge uh, part because um, when I was growing up, there wasn't much out there back in the late eighties. There was the, um, combat magazine that was in the uk but that was about it it was hardly any material out there but obviously today's world it's completely changed so the movies were a link um i suppose at the time in the mid 80s it was for me the the quick link would have been the karate kid that would have been the direct link because of the karate but um before that obviously the bruce films were just dramatic really of how to kick and punch, but I think the biggest influence would probably have been the karate kid because of the word karate and recognizing some of the moves and, and the suit that he was wearing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a big influence. It, it gets your attention. It keeps you, it keeps you interested and gives you something to work towards in certain parts of your training. You, know, you want to be that person on the screen or you want to be able to move like that person. So definitely. Um, and the books nowadays, there's just so much out there, uh, including a couple from myself, shameless plug. But um, yeah, huge. It's, it's just, I like to sit down and get a chance to go through literature so you get a good feel for it if you can't experience it direct. You said you have your own books. <laughs> that was a shameless plug. Yeah, well, have a couple, have a, I've shameless got a couple plugs of are, are are welcome on the show. I mean, we carve out time for it, so let's let's do that now. <laughs> Tell us about your books. I've just got a couple of um, cata books that I uh, I launched over the last four or five years. Again, based out of not having anything for to reference when I was training myself. So when I opened um, my club, I thought I want something that the students can have a, a reference for. So it was a simple. Uh, Kata and Bunkai book on the Heian uh, Penan series as a reference mainly, but it was quite um, caught the attention of quite a few people. So they, I've put it out there and had some great feedback on it for people who want to use it as a, as a fundamentals book, as I call it. So it's got some good basics in there for people. And then from on from there, there's a there's a Kata in the Shitori system called an Anku. And again, there's very much, there's very little written about that, or history hasn't been kind to that kata. So I, again, based on that, and for my students, I've put some information together and some um, bankai applications for kata and nanku. So that's out there as well. So the first one's called the Heian Pinan Kata, the fundamentals, and my latest one is Ananku form and function. Right on. And where can people find those? Uh, yeah, you can find them via Amazon and via Lulu or direct from myself. Okay. And uh, if you send us direct links to those, we'll make sure we put those in the show notes. So yeah, cool. Make, make it easy for people. And in case anyone's new to the show, show notes are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And that's where you can find everything we're talking about today. And just to keep everything kind of condensed, it'll make it a little easier for us on the back end. I know you've got some websites and some social media. So you want to, why don't you drop those in now before we keep going? Yeah, you can find me on most um, social media sites under the banner Lee Taylor Karate. So 
it's pretty straight, pretty straightforward. All my uh, social media is Lee Taylor Karate. It's easy, nice and easy. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's keep going. We're almost at the end. Cool. Let's talk about the future. We've talked about <sighs> what's going on now. We've talked about the past. The future. Let's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's. You know, we 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 jump into a TARDIS and we we go a ways into the future and we find you know, <laughs> five, ten years later oh, for man. you. What are, what are you doing? What's keeping you going? What's getting you up in the morning? Well, every day above ground is a good day. So just waking up and being appreciative of being awake is great, really. It's been quite a start to the year with a few um, people that have passed, um, some that were old friends and acquaintances, and unfortunately a recent instructor of mine as well. Um, and including my beloved pet, which we had for 14 years. So death, unfortunately, has played a bit of a part recently in my outlook. So like I say, every day above ground is a good day. But for the future, keep training, keep learning, and keep growing in all ways as a person, as a husband, as a father, as an instructor, and as a human being, really. All right. Well, this has been great. I've appreciated everything you've offered. I appreciate you um, taking the time. When you first emailed me, I said, are you sure you've got the right link? <laughs> <laughs> you did say that. I, I remember that. And I'll be honest, yeah. I I wondered myself, I, wait a second. <laughs> why was why a, is he saying that? Is this? Did we end up with the wrong guy? Because of the caliber of your, your show and, and the guests that you've had, um, I was like, he can't be sending it to me. It must be someone else. But you said it was a, a, a listener um, from my podcast. So yeah. I just like to take the moment to uh, thank that person, whoever it was. So I truly appreciate you putting my name forward and hope you managed to get something from my ramblings. Oh, of of course. And I, I think it's a good opportunity to, to point out that, you know, the goal on this story, uh, I'm sorry, on this show is to tell stories. It's to share the stories of martial artists and showcase mm. the fact that we are all so much more similar than we are different. We certainly are. And that's what martial arts does. It brings us all together regardless. Or it should. Mm. Because, of course, there are times where it does not, where we <laughs> focus so much on what differentiates us. Yes, that's, it is. Unfortunately, it's just like anything, I suppose. Um, different styles, different names. And it's, it's, uh, it is a shame, but we should come together because of the love we have for the art, not because of a label. Couldn't have said it better. And so what we do is we bring on the people that we think are going to have good stories. Some of those people are people that host podcasts. Some of them are people that our listeners have heard of. Most of them yeah. are people who are neither. I'm neither. <laughs> well, you have a podcast. Oh, yes, of course right? I have a podcast. Right. But most of the people that we bring on are what we can call, quote unquote, everyday martial artists, people who yeah. love training, they love maybe teaching, and they're just passionate. It's become a lifestyle for them. It and certainly I, has. Yeah, and I believe that the more of us saying this, sharing this, mm. the more opportunity we have to, to come together. I mean, yeah, I, I told you ahead of you know, the formal interview here about martialartspodcast.com, you know, the, the site that I don't know how many of the listeners are familiar with, where we essentially, if you want to look at it this way, promote our competition for this show. Yeah. yeah. Because it's not competition. It's, no. it's all it's, martial arts. It's, no. we do so the many... same stuff. And if yeah, I would I much rather have someone say, listen to your show, say, you know what? I prefer this show to martial arts radio. We lose a listener but we keep someone engaged in, in martial, martial arts, arts and keeps them exactly. passionate. And it, I believe firmly over time can help grow martial arts. So that's why we do what we do. And I want to thank you for being a part of it. I thank you for letting me be a part and share my story. And it's been 20 years on this current ride. And like I say, it's, it's shaped my life. It's uh, challenged my life and it's uh, grown my life. Fantastic. Now, the last thing I'm going to ask of you, the, the way we sign off all of these interviews, what parting words would you give to the people listening today? Well, you can use my um, dojo creed, which has helped a lot of students inside and outside the dojo. 
and that's strength, respect, humility, generosity. And you can put your explanations to any of those four. I don't know if you believe in fate or destiny, but I do, at least a little bit. And when I talk to someone like Sensei Taylor, it seems pretty clear that martial arts was always something he was supposed to be doing. And here now, training and running clubs and running his own show, it doesn't sound like he could be doing anything else. In fact, sometimes I talk to people on the show and it's clear martial arts is part of their life, maybe even a big part of their life. But Sensei Taylor, it, it is his life. And I can certainly relate to that, as you might imagine. If you want to see the show notes with photos and links and all the other stuff we talked about in the show, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, sign up for the newsletter, and then head on over to whistlekick.com, use the code PODCAST15, get you 15% off, maybe grab yourself a t-shirt or something. Support the show, help us out. If that's not the best way for you to help us right now, I would appreciate sharing this or another episode, maybe leave us a review on iTunes, or don't forget, you can leave us reviews for Whistlekick in general on Google on Facebook, plenty of other places. Anywhere that would take a review, I would be happy for. Our social media, of course, is at Whistlekick, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and a bunch more. If you want to email me directly, I'd love to hear from you. Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.